am glad that I have the revelation of the mighty God in Christ. And if you don't have it yet, you'll get it. We'll get you there. Hear, O Rizzle, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Amen. Thank God for the revelation of the oneness of God. And the fullness of understanding that we have in this generation and in this New Testament. Isaiah 62, in verse 1. Now I told you a few services ago that uh, God gave me a message. And he just happened to give it to me through my wife. Praise God. She screenshot a scripture and underlined one sentence. And when I read it, I said, well. And then she said, she said something like it, uh, a message or question, something like that. And when I saw it, I said, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. There is a message here. Isaiah 62 and 1, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness. And the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. In all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name. Let me just, just look up here for a minute. Israel had been carried into captivity. And they've cried out as they do so many times. And the Lord has heard them. And the immediate context this is a message by the prophet to the, to the people of Israel. And God is saying, this is what I'm going to do for you. And of course, especially in Isaiah, it often starts in an immediate context and then graduates to a future context to where he prophesies uh, concerning the coming of Christ because God's chosen people was, was Israel. But under the new covenant, they did not foresee the church upon which uh, happened. And I say they, uh, the, the people of Israel probably didn't. Obviously, the prophets and the Lord knew. And sometimes we begin in an immediate context and we wind up in a prophetic context whenever Jesus, uh, the, the Lord is pointing toward the time when the Messiah would come. And so I want to get you just a little bit on, on the same page here in this passage. I'm going to start again in 62 and 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness. And the salvation thereof is a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness. And all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name. Which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And thou shalt also be a crown of glory. In the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. And thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called, Hef, called Hefzeba and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee and thy land shall be married for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. And I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem. 
which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence and give him no rest till he established and till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Verse 4, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. And I want to preach to you this morning for a little while with your help. Everybody said amen. amen. The hope of the forsaken. The hope of the forsaken. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your divine touch and for your anointing, God, that we feel already and have felt since the beginning of the Bible study even until now. And we ask you to anoint these lips of clay to preach the oracles of the Lord, and we'll be careful to give you praise. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise as we're seated. How many's starting to get comfortable? I know you are because I can see you shifting and stretching your back and relaxing. How many can get comfortable and then conquer that flesh to help me preach a little bit? I ask you, is this still an apostolic church? Is this still a body of believers that believe in the preached word of God? Is this still New Life Church who is known among the district as a church that worships and preaches with the preacher? Amen. Well, let me tell you just, let me just give you a little how pastor feels. Y'all get with all these evangelists that show up. They come running up in here 22 years old with all that screaming energy. And it's a new voice. But listen, I'm getting old. So I need it worse than they do. And besides that, I'm pastor. I'm here all the time. Hey, man, come on. Is somebody going to get with pastor this morning? I tell you what, next time you call, need something, I'm going to say, well, call Brother Randall. I know what he'll say. I know what he'll say. He don't want your phone call, not where your problem is concerned. But since I'm pastor and I'm here all the time and I, I'm available, I wonder if I could just get New Life Church to help me preach this morning. Amen. Come on, I feel, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I feel a little bit of preach up in the house. We might as well go ahead and take advantage of the moment that we have. We got out of bed. We got dressed and we showed up to church. Why don't we just go ahead and have church for a little while this morning? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Well, I feel it. We find in our text today. That God is speaking to the nation of Israel who had turned from a monotheistic worship of the one true God to a mishmash of idolatry including the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth in combination with the worship of God, Jehovah. And because of this quote unquote spiritual adultery, God turned from Israel and the northern kingdom, this is the area around the Sea of Galilee, was invaded by the Assyrians. And in 732 BC, and it resulted in the complete loss of the northern territory. And then later in 722 BC, B.C., the Sumerian area fell to Assyria and resulted in the uh, deportation of vast numbers of Israelites to other parts of the Assyrian Empire. And because of their disobedience and because they had fallen into idolatry, apparently now they were identified as a forgotten, scattered nation. And as a matter of fact, and if you want to put verse 4 back up there, I didn't tell them this, but the Bible uses a specific word. It says the word they were termed forsaken. And the word termed here means to be named or to be labeled. 
In other words, whenever the subject of the nation of Israel was to come up, people would refer to them as the forsaken and their land as the desolate. Their whole identity had become wrapped up in the state that they were in, so much so that they were known everywhere as the nation who was forsaken. And in Old Testament times, the Israelites understood the power behind a name. Notice that it's not just a word, as in a verb. It is a name with a capital letter in the beginning. They understood the importance and the power behind a name. And whether there was actual spiritual blessing or power imparted through God... Uh, through a God-given name or whether the names given simply powerfully influence the thoughts and beliefs of the person about themselves, the names of the Old Testament characters in many ways predicted or foreshadowed important characteristics or the roles that they would play in their lives. You go study it out. So to be named forsaken was a terrible identity to assume. It was certainly not, Brother Stanley, it was certainly not the plan A that God had for Israel's future. And, 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 but somewhere sitting in the shadows, amen, observing what was going on was the prince and the power of the air and the enemy known as Lucifer or Satan. And he was thinking to himself, he was rejoicing because he knew, you know, as long as I can keep Israel distracted and immersed in other gods, if I can set a stumbling block with the idol worship of the surrounding nations, I can possibly disrupt the plan for the future because I know that the Messiah has to come from them, but it can never happen as long as they are forsaken. And so I'm going to give them a different identity. I'm going to give them a different name, and they're going to be known as forsaken as a people because as long as they're forsaken, the Messiah will never come from them. Oh, praise God, I've come to this church on a Sunday morning uh, of 2023 to preach to you. Many of you have lived that scenario in years gone by where you felt like you were forsaken and that your land were desolate. And some of you have even lived it during the year 2022 where you had just seemed like you had tried everything and nothing had worked and it appeared as though you were forsaken and the enemy thought he had you where he wanted you. You found yourself in a place that you you never intended to be, but somehow mistakes and poor decisions left you broken and alone, and sin caused you to be shattered, assuming an identity that the devil wanted you to have or to be stuck with for the rest of your life. Hallelujah. Come on. Some of you were already labeled. Some of you already had an identity and said, well, he'll be an alcoholic the rest of his life. I know what family he came from. He'll be a drug addict or or he'll be a sinner or a prostitute or whatever else. They already labeled you and the enemy had you where he wants you. But I want to tell you something. People looked and said they'll never be more than what they are right now. They are forsaken. Amen. Come on. I, I, is anybody either have lived that in the past or live it even recently and know what I'm talking about? Where you looked at your future and what the mess you had got yourself into and you said, dear God, how am I ever going to get out of this? And some of you just wanted to give up because everybody looked at you and said you were this way. But God had already chosen. God had already marked it down. God had already gave you an identity. And the enemy is trying to say that you're going to be forsaken. But can I tell you like God told Israel through the prophet Isaiah you shall no longer be termed forsaken I said you shall no longer be termed forsaken because there's hope for the forsaken in this day and hour hallelujah God's in the business of changing names and identities but he said In Isaiah 60 and 4, the first part of it, 
Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken. Look somebody near you and say, I'm not forsaken. No matter what it seems like. No matter what the devil has said. No matter what identity has been given to me. No matter what my past is. No matter what my family curse is. No matter what I struggle with. No matter what my vices are. No matter what my temptations are. No matter how many times I've failed and repented and failed again. It don't matter. Look at somebody and say, I am not forsaken. Come on, he said it. He said, you're not going to be forsaken. Neither shall thy land be any more termed desolate. That's a whole other message right there. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah. And I went and looked that up. Hephzibah is found twice in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 21 and 1 in which Hephzibah is the name of King Hezekiah's wife. And then in Isaiah 62 and 4, only two times, it's translated from the original Hebrew, Hephzibah, and it literally means my delight is in her. Not only are you going to be not forsaken, it's not just that you're going to be restored to normalcy, but my delight is going to be in you. And then when you look at the root word, it has a connotation of guarding, protecting. And then he said, Isaiah 60 and 4, and thy land shall be called Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be what? Married. Beulah means married. So not only is my delight going to be in you, in the sense that I, I, I care for you so much, I am going to be your chief protector. All right, yes. But we are, you are going to be betrothed to me, and eventually you are going to be married to me. And not only will you go from being forsaken and desolate like an outcast cast aside. You say, what, 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 what's the, what are you getting at, brother? It's like a woman. In this case, I'm going to use a woman because that's the context. It could be a man too. But you know, a woman who has committed adultery and then kicked out and discarded like a piece of trash over it. Yeah. Come on. They all know she's probably not proud of what she did. But there, she was abandoned. She no longer had possessions. You've got to think of the Old Testament context and how that the, 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 the man provided for the woman. And she didn't have any fields to glean crops from. Her lamb was gone away and desolate as an adulterer. Not only that, she had no man to love her as a bride. No man to protect her as her protector. But he said, you're going to go from that outcast young woman to somebody whom I delight in. I'm going to restore you back in harmony with the groom. And I'm going to protect you. And not only that, we're going to be married. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, let me tell you. We went on vacation to Colorado. And we stopped in uh, uh, one of them places. It's a Spanish name. San something. And they had a a creek or a river that was flowing through over the rocks. And man, there was, it was cold. So there was people out there swimming and tubing and, and riding surf, uh, uh, surfing because where the, 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 rock, the water went over the rocks and came these rapids, it created a big wave. And you could go out there and ride it. And they had, uh, you know, the, these protective body suits and everything where they stayed warm. And I'm sitting, we just went out there to just get out of the car and relax for a few minutes. And those of you that had lots of children, you know what I'm talking about. And my, we were sitting out down by the edge of the river. And there was an area where nobody was at. And, and my, my boys were skipping rocks. And I, I got distracted for a moment. And there was one of those ladies that was real athletic and strong. 
And she was out there surfing. Well, she, 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 she got out of the wave and, and trying to get back to the bank. She floated down into the area where my, my kids were throwing rocks. And Preston had got some little bitty pellets, little bitty pea gravel, and he just kind of slung it like that. Well, a few pieces of that pea gravel landed on top of that woman. I didn't know it. And, and she come out of there. I, I turned around just right after she had already started. And I got a little seven-year-old. And she jumped all over him, began to ream him out to his face. I'm talking about verbally abusive. Now, I know it was a woman. But, hey, she was tough. I could tell. So if me and her get in a fight, you know, it might be a fight. But, but what happened is I, before I even had a chance to think, I acted. Now, I want to I tell you how I feel about it. Y'all stay with me now. Don't want to lose you right here. I don't mind you getting on to my kids. But you better have a relationship with them. You don't get on to people's kids when you don't know who they are. You don't have no clue about the history. You don't know what they went through that day. You don't know them as a person, a character. You don't know their struggles and their particular needs. You don't know if they had a nap or didn't have a nap. So we're, we're all a part of a body here. We, it takes a group. Sometimes we have to get kids and straighten them. Hey, quit doing that. Don't stop running and all that. But if you, if you really get on to my kids, that's fine. Do it. Do it. I'm not going to do nothing. But, but make sure you've got a relationship with them. I don't know if that's wrong or right. I just, that's just me. But this woman don't know Preston from Adam. And when I turn around and realize what's happening, I didn't, I, I, I didn't think about it. I reached and grabbed him. And I, I just did like this by the collar of his shirt and put him behind me. And uh, I stayed Christian. But I did absolutely unequivocally without any imagination put a stop to what was happening. And I told her, I said, you got a problem? He accidentally did it. You come talk to me. You don't say another word to my seven-year-old child. You get back over there and get back on your board and you leave him alone. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what she thought was going to happen. But... Uh, like I said, I know it was a lady, but she was pretty tough. <laughs> but guess what? There's something, you know, everybody talks about the love of a mother, and I, 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 I understand, I, I mean, I don't understand it, but I agree with it. When you carry that baby, there's something about the love of, of, of a mother, it's, there's nothing else like it. But I want to say something about the love of a daddy. Come on. It, it, it's a different kind of love. It's one of these that where... You know, I may tear your rear end up, but the next day I may, I may, I may knock somebody out on your behalf. And when, when, when I'll say this, it doesn't matter who it had been. And I, I, I'm not real big. I'm fast. But it didn't matter. There's something in, in your spirit that triggers and there's a little, little key that turns. And all of a sudden, there is no more fear. I don't care if I'm... Four foot ten and he's seven foot two. It, there's, no more, there's no more fear involved. Right, right. And what I went into, I went into, I, I, it was, I don't know, it's just a, just a realm of protection. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the Lord is saying, listen, yeah. you, you might even make some mistakes. Yeah. But as long as you're my child and as long as you're to be, my bride to be is in the, the context. I want you to know you're going to have a protector and it's a masculine kind of protector. It's one that's going to step up and take on a war field and a battle on your behalf. You're no longer forsaken, but you got a husband. you got a protector. you got somebody that's going to restore. You're going to be my wife. Actually, that land that it talks about, you know, it says on Beulah land. When you look at it, it's a little more like a, a land that's in preparation 
before the marriage. It's like leading up to heaven's gate. You know, it's like uh, we, we're doing this in anticipation of what the what we're about to do. And when I when I read that, it took me back to another memory. And it wasn't mine. I mean, it's my memory, but it wasn't me. We were a couple of years ago when uh, Brother Josh Meyer and Sister Amy started looking sideways at each other. We were over at the Toledo Bend, and we were at Memorial Day, and it was the, it was the Army Rec Center, and we had just walked down to the water's edge where there was a sandbar. You remember that, Josh? I'll, you'll remember it in a minute. And, and, and we were sitting there just kind of watching the water, and there was a few guys that had enjoyed the weekend a little more than the others, and they showed down there, with, with, with their filters not on right. because of alcohol. Right. And one of them spoke in such a way that was inappropriate to Sister Amy. And I, <laughs> I, I saw Brother Josh, a side of him that many of you, you ain't never seen. Come up here, Brother Josh. <laughs> Come on, boy. Son, look at them. Look at them arms right there. He don't look like much, but then when you really get to looking, there's much more there than what you realize. <laughs> look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Son, he come up out of there, and he confronted that guy. And I don't remember exactly. He didn't, he didn't get out of the way. He didn't say nothing bad. But, brother, when he got done, there was no question who was his girl. And, who, and how you going to not speak to her. I thought, okay. I did. You know, I was getting to know Josh, I, I, Brother Josh. I know him a little more now, but I saw a little fire that I hadn't seen before. He was ready to take on everybody on the beach. <laughs> it wasn't really a beach, just saying. Everybody on the bank. And, and that guy realized he had done messed up and he started apologizing and Josh sit back down you know I, I didn't even go I didn't say nothing to him I didn't even go near him I said buddy he's ready to knock somebody out I don't want to and uh but 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 that was his his woman still is and he was ready And I want to tell you, it, 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 it come back to me because we need to understand who we are. Yes. You, you are no longer forsaken, Brother Rob. Come on, right, come on. You got a new identity. Now, I know you're a man. You are, you're a man's man. But really, you're a bride too, though. Because you're a part of the church. <laughs> hey, hey, you, you're no longer forsaken, but you got a protector. You got somebody that says, I'm going to change your identity and your name from forsaken. It's going to be Hephzeba, which means the one I delight in and that I protect. It's the land's not going to be desolate, but it's going to be Beulah land because I'm preparing for what I'm about to do. And I'm telling you, folks, there's a day and hour we live in now under the new covenant where we have a hope. And the hope is that this is that the, there is no longer, uh, the identity is no longer coming against the forsaken. There is hope for the forsaken. And I, I want to ask brother, brother, uh, brother, brother Justin to read us, help me read the end of this passage in, Acts, in Isaiah 62 and verse 11. And he's going to use my microphone, brother Daniel. He's using my singing mic just in case. It says, Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation okay, cometh. Okay, hold on. During the course of this chapter, I left out a few verses. But he's, he's talking about Israel. But there, there begins to come an element into the middle of the prophecy to where he begins to refer to the Messiah when he would come. Yes. And that's why in particular that he said, Behold, Zion, thy salvation cometh. He's talking about a time when you don't understand it now. But out 
of your wombs, out of your descendants, there's going to be one that rises up who's going to be the salvation, not only of Israel, but of the, the future chosen people, the church. And, and Paul said, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. I want to tell you something. You are a chosen people. You're a part of the future church that they didn't foresee at that time. And your salvation has come in the form of the Messiah. Notice this. Behold, thy salvation cometh. Go ahead. Behold, his reward is with him in his work before him. Mm, let me just say something. He did a work on Calvary. And it, it's the work by which we are all justified. The sacrifice of the Lamb of God once fell all, he entered into the holy place. And because of the work that he did, we are made righteous in the sight of God. But I want to tell you something. His work is not done. It didn't just finish. He said it's finished, but then he gave a command and said, Go ye into all nations. I'm telling you, though, that the work has come before him, and we are a part of that work. But notice what he said next in verse 12. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. The redeemed. Yeah. Israel, I'm going to restore the, the, you know, I'm going to give you back the city and all of that stuff. But there's coming a time in the future that you have not understood yet when your salvation is going to come. And then they're going to be called the redeemed of the Lord. In Revelation, when we stand before the throne, it says the redeemed of the Lord are going to be called out. If you've been born again by the water and the spirit, if you've been baptized in the name of Jesus and filled with the Holy Ghost, you are a part of the redeemed. You have been purchased out of slavery by the blood of Jesus. For you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold were seen by the vain conversation of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a, a lamb without spot and without blemish. There's been a price paid for you. You know, they used to have dowries. And I don't know what Sister Burks would have been worth, but it would have been a lot in my mind. But that, we don't do that no more. We just pay $10,000 for a wedding. Yeah. Amen. Well, I better stop. We've got two weddings coming up before I get in trouble by these brides. The holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. Finish that verse. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. You were once called forsaken. But there will come a time when you shall be called, capital, sought out. Right. A city not forsaken. I know contextually we've got the... The, the, the Israel and Jerusalem in the mind but when because of the context of the prophetic with the salvation of the Lord coming and with the redeemed of the people I'm telling you there's people who are seeking for what we have it's not everybody because people who don't want to really change and people who are not serious about their salvation they're not coming here no. you know why because they walk in and they say man what music what worship the people are friendly. Man, the preaching's awesome. You're not bored. I, man, I, this is awesome. But that is the apostolic Pentecostals. And I know a little bit about how they work and how they live for God. I also know that they don't just show up for show on Sunday, but they live for God at work on Monday, and they live for God at school on Wednesday, and they, they walk a different life. They make changes. They put down the drugs. They don't look the same. They don't talk the same. They don't act the same. If I do this, I'm going to have to give up this, and I'm going to have to give up that, and they begin to count the cost. 
They count the cost and they say, I'm not willing to pay that price. But for those who are hungry, for those who are seeking, we are sought out because there's nowhere else they can go to find what will give them what they need. And so they're seeking for something. And I'm telling you, there's hope for those that's seeking. There's hope for the forsaken. And we've got the truth. We've got the word. We've got the church. We need to share it to the whole world and to our community. Sought out. And I want Sister Burks or whoever I want them to come. How long have I been preaching, Brother Campbell? 35. Man, I'm going backwards. As I get older, they say you get like, you know, a child. So I'm going to go backwards to when I used to evangelize and preach 30 minutes every night. And y'all can start rejoicing and shouting over it. 35 minutes. But I'm telling you, the point of this thing is a simple thought, but the point of it is many times through decisions and mistakes and struggles of our own, and sometimes just in life in general, we get labeled and named what, it, what the enemy wants us to be identified as. That's why when Daniel and Azariah and Michelle and I can't remember all of them right off the top of my head. But when they were brought into captivity, one of the first things that pagan king did was change their name. He altered their appearance. He began to tell them they had to do certain things and change their diet. And he said, we're going to, we're, this was a science. They knew how to do it. They took the, the talented and the gifted and the leaders. And they said, now these are the people that will lead a revolt. These are the people that have the power to, to bring about change in Israel. We're going to pull them out of the land and take them with us. And our job is to recondition them. They have talents and giftings, but we want them to do it for us instead of their homeland and for God and Jehovah. And so we're going to repurpose them. We're going to change what they look like. We're going to change what they eat, what they think. We're going to even change their name so much so that when their identity later on, when they begin to look at it, they're not even going to remember who they were in the past. But oh, they didn't realize who they had. Daniel, the three Hebrew children. Daniel refused to eat the meat offered to idols. He, they said, you got to pray. They made the decree, you got to pray. Can't pray to anybody else except the king. He continued to face his, his, his face toward Israel. Every day he prayed just like he was supposed to. And I realized they called them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But in my mind, I, I guarantee you when they saw one another, they didn't refer to each other that way. We're not going to change our names. We're not going to forget where we come from. We're not going to forget who we are. And we get a little peek into the future. In a way, when you look at the prayer of Daniel, because he began to fast and pray. And said, God, we got to have an answer. First day he prayed and fasted and didn't get no answer. But he was looking toward Jerusalem. And I understand why he did it. But what we see is that it doesn't matter where you're looking toward. Amen. Unless you're looking up. God's everywhere. He began to fast. Three days came around and then no answer. Seven days fasting and praying. No answer. Finally on the 21st day. The angel of the Lord, Michael the archangel, showed up. I believe it was Michael. Is that right? And he said, from the very first day you knelt down to pray, your voice was heard. Some of you have been praying for a long time about stuff. It seems like that God's not hearing you, but I'm telling you, he heard it the first time it ever came out of your mouth. He has not forgot about it. He said, but I was withstood by the prince of Persia. I had to do war in the spiritual realm on your behalf. But I've got a respite in the battle and I've come in the midst of what I'm doing over there to answer your prayer because God cares about you. I 
he began to minister to him. He was over, he said, now I'm going to go back and fight. Folks, I'm telling you, we need to realize there is a spiritual realm that we're involved in. And it's because of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's angels on our behalf. And I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm going to preach a message. But sometimes he sends angels, but sometimes he comes just all by himself. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the music plays, you're going to bow down at the statue. And they said, oh, king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. We know that our God is well able to deliver us out of your hand. But if he don't, we're still not going to bow. What are you going to say tomorrow when you get tempted? What are you going to say at school when somebody offers you something you know you don't not have? Satan, I want you to know something. I recognize what you're doing. But I've been delivered. I was forsaken, but I've got a name now. And I want to tell you that God's able to deliver me from this temptation. But if I die trying, it don't matter either way. I'm not going to yield to it. I'm not going to bow down to the idolatry and paganism and the culture of this world, entertainment and everything else that goes on. But I'm going to stand. I said, I'm going to stand when everybody else is bowing. I'm going to stand and I'm not going to bow to an idol. But I'm only going to worship the one true God. He got angry at first and ordered the men to throw him in the fiery furnace. I've seen depictions of it. It appears that perhaps it was built at the base of a cliff, maybe even up inside of a cave. They heated it with a chimney that went up, or it could just be smoke. But they had things for this kind of stuff. Some say that they walked up to a hole in the ground and dropped him in the hole and went down to the base of the mountain to the fire. Either way, the heat was bursting forth so strong from the furnace that those that went to put them in, it consumed and killed them. Couldn't get away from it. But when they fell down into the fire, the first thing that happened was the chains of the ropes that had them bound burned off. And John the Baptist said, there's one who's coming after me. Whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear, stoop, latchets to stoop down and unleash. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That's talking about purification. It's like when they purify gold and all the impurities come out, but the gold separates itself and comes forth tried. And that flame burn off the chains. Say, Brother Burks, I've been to churches, but I never could get deliverance of situations and situations. It's because you weren't baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Yeah. You cannot do some of these things on your own. Some of these addictions and vices and lifestyles and everything, you can't do it by yourself. It's not just a mental sin. God likes you to have buy-in, but it's the power of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And it burns away the things that has you bound and all of a sudden they looked around and here the fire is burning but they're not feeling it it's not it's not burning their flesh their hair is still there the Bible says that when they they came out that there wasn't even the smell of smoke on their bodies While they were in there, they said there's king looked in there and said, There's one that's likened to an angel, the son of man. He saw something they'd never seen. God's gonna be with you through every trial, every fire, every situation. Because you have a hope you're not forsaken anymore. And that old song says, I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before no sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter anymore I'm looking now just across the river where my faith shall end in sight There's just a few more days to labor then I'll take my heavenly flight Beulah land I'm longing for you 
Someday on thee I'll stand. There my home shall be eternal. Beautiful land, sweet beautiful land. But can I tell you that we're still walking in the protection of the betrothed. The groom is waiting for the ceremony. The land has already been bought. The mansions have already been prepared. He said, I go away to prepare a place for you so that where I am there you may be also. And if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Amen. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout. And with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. Trying to comfort you this morning. Why don't we stand right now? There is a hope for the forsaken. If you're sitting under the sound of my voice right now, I want the church to begin to pray. And you're trying to dig yourself out of the past and the life that the enemy has tried to label you in. Why don't you step out from where you're at and say, God, I want to lay hold on that hope of the Messiah. Lord, that promise that you've given the church. Maybe you're just struggling in your walk with God, but you need to remind, be reminded that God is here for you. You're special. Hey Amen. You're the bride of Christ. Why don't you just respond all over this building?